Georgia Virtue presents the Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong podcast. Thanks for tuning in to episode 216. This week, we have Singing About Monkeys, Skiing in New Hampshire, Guatemalan Fishing, I had to look that one up, Russian Art, The Border, Federal Animal Cruelty, No Intelligent Life Found, Glock Giggle Switches, Paying for Marriage Decisions After the End, and Government Property Theft. I'm Dave Roberts. With me is my partner in this endeavor, writer, journalist, dog mom, and owner of the GeorgiaVirtue.com, Jessica Salaji. Hi, Dave. How was I'm your week? Just coming back from a vacation, so... I am. I'm less, less good than you. He's certainly less tan. Yes, for sure. Uh, two of the couples came down with us. We got a got a three bedroom house with a pool, and all three bedrooms had king size beds, so that that's always nice. Uh, the owners were great. This down in Jupiter, just north of West Palm. Super easy flights to get in and out. But man, anytime you travel, it's a full day of travel. By the time you get to the airport early enough to catch your flight, fly, get through the airport, you know, getting down, get, get your bags, either get to where you parked your car or go to your rental car and get it. I mean, it's a full day of travel. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, yeah, no, I know. I, I'm whining and moaning about, about so what, well, how hard it was coming back for vacation. I mean, AC guys do make good, good livings down there. Yeah. Because they, they do get uh, air conditioning calls, you know, in December. That's true. Would you ever move there? Well, I, I don't know. There's a there's a lot of stuff that reminds me of why I still don't live in South Florida. Mm. <laughs> but it, it's, it's, I mean, I'd have a house down there. I don't know if I would live there. But, of course. But since nobody's offering to buy me a house down there, I guess I'll just keep the one I have here in Dallas. Again. You poor thing. I know. I know. It's awful. Did your week go well? Your Dave-less week? Yeah. I mean, I didn't get any letters threatening to sue me, so I guess that's a win. Is it, though? Is it? It is. You can only fight so many battles at one time. Well, that's probably true. Yeah. But, you, you know, if, if, they're, if they're pushing back, it means you're doing something right. That goes with I, so many things. I agree. I'm just, you know, literally, you don't want to be like fighting fires on all fronts. Well, that's true, too. That's how you get burned, right? Oh, so, nicely done. <laughs> last week, Republican uh, Senator James Lankford of Oklahoma released the annual federal fumbles. These are great. Yeah, I feel like a couple senators do these, which... You know, I know I don't think too many can. I think they should all I think they should all be required to post like 10 things they think the federal government wrongly spent money on, because I guarantee you that most senators can't tell us anything. The, the federal government spent money on. No, they can find the ones that are highlighted, but, you know, it's not going to use their state. None of these are going to come from Oklahoma. Well. True. So we have $15,000 in taxpayer money towards funding an opera about monkeys. I'm not surprised. I mean, like the list of things, the list is long. I don't know if you download it. It's like a PDF that you can download and he has it in a football theme. But I mean, the $15,000 on monkey opera is like the least worst part. What opera is this? Is this Planet of the Apes? Is it... Which apes are not monkeys. I'm not sure. I feel like if it was, they would have said that. Yeah, I. It's a when you look at the overall budget, fifteen thousand is nothing. But when you think about what kind of opera is being put on about monkeys, that seems like that would put on a lot of shows. Like that's a lot of tickets for going to see something. And I mean, uh, no doubt opera. Well, my, my thing is, is 
the fifteen thousand dollars is what put it on. Well, who got the the revenue from it? You know, right? Because it's not. I I doubt this was some like free show. I I doubt that. Uh, half mill to revamp a New Hampshire ski club. Three million dollars for a fisherman co-op in Guam. <laughs> fisherman co-op in Guam. Three million. Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't think catching fish in Guam would be that difficult. Uh, the National Endowment of the Humanities moved to give 120000 to two authors who write books on Russian art. Why? This is when the whole like idea of grants goes wrong. Oh, yeah. Plus, if you're writing good stuff on Russian art, and look, that's a legitimate thing to write about, especially if you have... You know, your PhD in in Russian art, that seems like, you know, you could sell that book to other people who are, I don't know, studying Russian art. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many chapters do you think are are dedicated to little Fabergé eggs? I don't know. Oh, no, no, it wasn't the eggs, it was the dolls, the Russian dolls. I wonder how many chapters are dedicated to the the dolls, one inside the other. I'm not sure, but I don't want to know based on a government study <laughs> or a government book. Of course, you know, Lankford's a Republican, so he hammered stuff that's happened at the um, border. Yeah, we have the border boondoggle. Uh, Biden paid DOD contractors millions a day not to build the wall, but to babysit the fence materials on the ground ready to be installed. I mean, that's, that's embarrassing. It really is. I mean, we're, we're not going to build it, but you can't have the materials, one. And, well, absolutely, because he promised to end building the wall. And I, I guess that, that was more important to him than you know, the way the, the money was structured is, yeah, the, it cost the government a bunch of money not to build the wall. Doesn't matter what you, what you think about it. Once the once once the, the ink was down on, on that contract, that's it. It actually cost us more. Uh, DHS now plans to de- deploy robot dogs that will cost anywhere from ninety G's up to one hundred and fifty per. I mean, my thing is, is like I'm not really with the the robot dogs. I think the robot. Dogs are great in situations where you're dealing with bombs or a substance. You're not sure of what it is. But when you're talking about something like this, I mean, all we hear is that there aren't enough staff down at the border. There's not enough or staff, excuse me, like ice people. There's not enough people to rescue people who are in bad conditions or to stop, you know, large caravans and stuff. And so instead we think that, I mean, what what good is an hundred and twenty thousand or one hundred fifty thousand dollar robot dog going to do us other than get it on camera so we can talk about that it happened? Right. I, we already have drones, and they cost a hell of a lot less. We already have night That's vision true. that are on drones, and you can pick up you can pick up that data without inventing something completely new. Also, if you have a um, wall. You can install cameras on top of the wall. Yeah, you also don't need as much in the way of ice and border border control when you have checkpoints, right? And you have gates. So instead of trying to operate within some great, you know, vast desert, it's narrowed down to certain uh, bottlenecks that are natural choke points for, 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 you know, well, for anything. But it, you, when you narrow that area down, like just go and pick them up. The, the, the border, we, we have for decades handled it so poorly. So I, none of this really surprises me. It just makes you shake your head. And then the obvious, Biden administration's infamous $30 million grant program offering safe smoking kits that would help reduce the risk of smoking illicit substances such as crack cocaine or crystal methamphetamine. Did they end up going 
I mean, did they go through with all that? I don't know. I I, I know that I think, because of all the backlash, they were, you know, looking at the direction of it, I guess. But I never heard them say we're not doing it. I mean, I think there should be something commercially available that you could put your Coke in and see if it's got fentanyl in it. Because that's what, that's what got those uh, West Point cadets down in Florida at spring break. It wasn't the Coke they were snorting, which, you know, is enough to throw them out of the Army. But it's the fentanyl that was in it that caused the, the overdose. Mm-hmm. So it'd so be you, nice if something you, was commercially available for, you know, the adult drug user. Are, are, are you serious? Yeah, why shouldn't you have a way of testing the drugs to make sure that what you're getting is what you're getting? It's a commercially available, not government. Well, sure. But I mean, if it's commercially, my thing, here's my problem. And I mean, it speaks to a bigger problem, but like something that has to be commercially available like that has to be FDA approved or, um, you know, like it's still going to require some level of government and they're, they can't do that right. So they haven't yet, but they hand out Narcan like it's candy. They do. I, th- I think you can actually go up to a pharmacy now and get Narcan. That is correct. You can. So if you if you plan on having a long weekend with some pills you got from some questionable, sketchy dude at Walmart parking lot, I mean, you can go ahead and have the fentanyl in hand. But Narcan, I mean, can Narcan re- reverse fentanyl? In some of I the doses know. where, I mean, I like surely there's a limit on how much. How much it reverses? Yeah, I'm sure. Or like, how much it can really accomplish you know i've i've heard them narcanning people you know four and five times get them to come around and then they still have to have yeah it, yeah it, and they still wake up pissed because their high is gone well sure but they yeah i mean that's it's a whole that's that's probably another show it's it's yeah it's one more uh solution for a problem that government created yeah mm-hmm. Research indicates that the federal government is responsible for the vast majority of animal cruelty in this country. This, yeah, this one will piss you off. Uh, According to a recent report, the government spends millions of taxpayer dollars every year on animal laboratories that carry out unethical testing on animals through grants, contracts, and experiments within its own labs. So there's a project, well, there's a there's a report that's produced by the White Coat Waste Project, WCW, and they put the Up in Smoke um, report out, I guess, annually, and they just talk about corrupt practices and different taxpayer um, programs, obviously, that have to do with any type of medical or anything like that. And they talk about the millions of dollars that they tested, they used to test cannabis and e-cigarette stuff on animal experiments, um, which is, I guess, a violation of the federal spending transparency law that we have, you're not supposed to do that. And it said one experiment, pregnant mice were confined to a chamber where they were forced to breathe e-cigarette vapors for hours um, after giving birth, their pups went underwent behavioral tests and were then killed and their brains analyzed. However, experimenters openly acknowledged significant differences between rodent brain development and human develop brain human brain development. Um, and then in another one, they forced the mice to breathe a, ver- a variety of flavored e-cigarette vapors to study the effects of vaping on the heart. But notably, they said the... <laughs> Caution should be exercised when extrapolating the findings in the mouse heart to the human heart due to the presence of the many obvious differences. So, I mean, if you know that, if you know there's like massive differences, where, why bother? Yeah, if if going in, why bother? Why bother is they have a a conclusion and they're looking for evidence to support their their conclusion. So their conclusion is the flavored uh, vape products are worse than the cigarette flavored. Uh, their conclusion is that it's you know really bad for. And I'm sure I'm sure it's not. <laughs> it's nicotine in any of its forms is not exactly uh, health conscious for for pregnant mothers. It's not health conscious for anybody, but it's certainly a decision that adults can make. But they started off with this conclusion that were and worked backwards from it. And I understand part of part of scientific uh, method is the theory, 
but yeah, they chose. I don't know if my if they chose mice because they're cheap, or because they knew they'd be in trouble if they used chimps. I guess. Well, they, I mean, they should arguably be in trouble either way. Well, I don't, I don't disagree, but I'm, I, the the imagery of mice in a cage to most people is a lot more acceptable than seeing uh, Bubbles the chimp sit there with with a with an e cig puffing away. Mm-hmm. I want to be cut up and analyzed because we we have a soft spot in our hearts for animals that we think are cute. Yeah, I think the. Yeah, I mean, we do. I. Do you think that they do these? This is what I always wonder. Like, do you think they do these things in anticipation that people will never find out? I think they do it in anticipation that nobody will ever care. Well, I mean, even if people care, what can they really do? Like, what can you truly do when your government does something at the federal level or in an agency like this where, like, I mean, you don't have any right to go talk to um, oh my gosh, I don't even know who. You also will, will never get through all the layers with plausible de- deniability, with dotted line supervision, with uh, contractors were saying, well, we didn't really know what the contractor was doing. Well, the, this report, well, my assistant must have, must have read that report. Well, where's your assistant? Retired. So by the time any of this stuff comes out, there, there's, you, there's no clear chain of command where somebody's in charge. Mm-hmm. So it is set up that way. Corporations have, have picked that up. Try setting a, a, a an appointment for some sort of procedure w- with a doctor. Well, the doctor's not in charge anymore. Who's in charge? Well, the billing goes to this central office. It's the same thing with the federal government. They, they kind of picked up on the trick where nobody's in charge. It's all, if, if, I, if I complain about it, I'm just doing my job, sir. You can tell this is somebody who just went to the TSA twice in a week. <laughs> just trying to do my job. Well, your job's stupid. <laughs> I mean, I think it's sad. I agree with you. I mean, nothing's obviously nothing's going to happen. Um, no one will be held accountable for this. Um, I mean, I just I think it's sad. I think it's sad. I, I don't know what we're supposed to do, but I think it's a, a, an inappropriate use of money. I'm not okay with. I'm not okay with my tax dollars going to any type of animal testing. Well, I don't, and that's the thing, I don't, I, even if people become aware of it, uh, as soon as someone starts protesting over animal experimentation, they're, they're immediately made into kooks. And True. You, you, back in the 90s, and certainly in the 80s and stuff, we knew the labs that were doing it and people went and protested them. I defy anybody to grab this report and find out exactly what labs are doing exactly what and for what reasons. Documents acquired by Vice via public records request have revealed details about a secretive government program that was researching highly speculative and often outlandish theories and technologies, including the development of invisible cloaks, invisibility cloaks, and the feasibility of a building a tunnel <laughs> through the moon using <laughs> nuclear explosions. Yeah, so obviously on the topic of government spending, um, Reason posted all of the documents that are related to this. I'm not really, I'm not really sure who would want to like go through them. I just the summary to me is is sufficient. Um, but it's this program that was conducted by the Advanced Aerospace Weapons System Application Program, which is AAWSAP. That's that's how they. Um, and then they also did like it overlapped with this threat identification program, which is obviously Defense Intelligence Agency and the Department of Fen- Defense and all that. Um, this is the same one that did the study of the UFOs and the phenomena related to that in 2020. I mean, it, they, we came out in 2020 during COVID, but we kind of like just breezed on through it. But this invisible cloaking theory and experiments, they explored camouflage, transparency and cloaking. And it honestly discusses technological challenges to making a practical invisibility cloak. The report's chosen illustrations of invisibility-related concepts included um, the novel The Invisible Man, Jellyfish, and Invisible Woman, um, a character from Fantastic Four, 
And they were trying to assess, like, when on a spectrum you become not entirely visible. And then there was this other report from the same, I guess, program that discusses, like, negative uh, mass propulsion and the, the possibility of harnessing wells of negative mass for space travel. So it just happens that the center of the moon is a potential well, making a tunnel through the moon provided there is a good supply of negative mass, and it could revolutionize interstellar spaceflight. Um, and I guess my issue, they spent $22 million over five years, but my issue is that, um, oh, and this was an Obama administration thing. You know, if if a private company wants to study all these things, by all means, like, go for it. I don't really care one way or the other if we can shoot a tunnel through the moon and, or if I, I mean, if I want to become invisible, I would just turn off the phone. Um, but. Well, the <clears throat> invisibility stuff here, the military applications are far reaching and, and people. But they didn't they start, finish. Well, they, yeah, they start with the idea of invisibility and you end up with advanced camouflage. With the idea of, of becoming as invisible as possible. But the thing is, if if you develop this thing, if you develop the cloak of invisibility or whatever goofy movie that's from, I was at a Harry Potter thing. Anyway, if you accomplish something similar to that, or you can make a vehicle virtually disappear in the desert to the naked eye, the the money you'll make selling that to the government is enormous. So if if, uh, if somebody, if, if Musk... Or Branson or somebody else wants to take a look at these technologies and say, look, this is this is viable. By all means, invest your own money into it. Yeah, I I don't yeah, I I mean I agree. I just and I'm I'm not a proponent of the US government um ever being the research entity. I mean that's government no, was never it's supposed to be that and you know, they, it just gives the government powers that it shouldn't have. Like, for instance, with Senator Harry Reid pushing for the entire program to remain secret. And his argument was that, you know, it allows the U.S. to maintain a position as a world leader because we're studying these things. I mean, that's all fine and well. And I understand why. But, you know, it's really easy to keep a secret when it's a private entity. Right. And... The thing is, we, we we make fun of the Russians for running a uh, 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 like paranormal programs to see if they could interrupt Reagan's brain waves and things like that. And then we've got the government going, huh, invisibility cloak. Huh, I dig it. How much do you need? Well, and I, I know it's not going to shock you at all, but the person, the company that was like contracting with the government to get this project off the ground is a guy named um, Robert Bigelow and he was Harry Reid's friend. And, um, of course he was, he was the sole bidder for the contract. <laughs> uh, well, of course, because it was, a, it was a secret bid. Right. And but. there's no tactical reason for keeping the, the invisibility idea secret. Well, I mean, if you're working on it, that's you're working on it. And if another country finds out you're working on it, then they can work on it, too. Like, that doesn't mean anything. Why does it have to be a secret that that's what we're working on? You know, right. The 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 materials and and everything else that go into it and the technology that comes out of it. You certainly don't. That's certainly secret. But the the, the fact that this exists and this is what they're working on with our money should not. But oh, good are. God. But here we are. Our our forefathers would be just... Uh, the, uh, our forefathers uh, who were like amazing scholars and didn't need government to make them scholars, no less. You know? Right. And now we have the, li the efforts to find alien life have gone nowhere. What's the new strategy, Jess? Well, so they... Like, what they do now, or I guess what they have been doing, is um, pointing radio antennas, antennas at the sky. And they, I've been hoping that when they do that, they will hear um, 
a broadcast from an alien civilization. <clears throat> and and I guess it would be like, well, they said that it's hard because it'd be like whispering or hearing listening for a whisper in a hurricane. Um and even if it's like faint, you know. This is just another thing that's funny to me. Like the United States believes it has the authority to be the NSA for the space system to, or the, the, the solar system too. Like we just listen to everyone because we think we can, um, whatever. But now they are trying to use, they're trying to use like higher technologies and technologies for long wave range microwave to send messages to the planet in hopes that they'll like come back to us. Again, same program, like SETI program funded by, same as what we were just talking about. This is their new approach. Um, it, 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 it could is shrink a, the cosmic ocean. Even if, if you shrunk it by a factor of 100,000 or a million, it's still, the, the vastness of space uh, can hardly be comprehended by the human mind. Yeah, we don't even know how far it goes. Right. So is there intelligent life out there? Probably. There's none around here. Um, is there life out there? Almost certainly. There's no way that Earth developed in a vacuum. Of course, there'd be something. And most likely the first bit of life we will ever find, and it's probably not going to be in my lifetime, is going to be a, a fungus or going to be... Uh, a single-celled organism, something like that, and and that will prove the theory of of life on on other planets. But we can't even we can't. The money spent to do that. Plus, look, if there really are little green men who are buzzing Earth, I assure you they've seen our reality TV and have no desire to come down here. I don't blame them. I mean, yeah, they're they're buzzing by, going, oh look. And turn, they turn on the news, go, ah, uh -huh, they're killing each other. Turn on the Real Housewives of New Jersey, go, huh, well, we're out of here. Give them another million years to develop. Well, and like this new idea is reliant on this, the premise, I guess, that like one colony is sending radio signals to another colony, which may not be on the same... I mean, we don't use microwaves to communicate with China, like send them up into the universe and send them over. Like things go by encryption and, and digital stuff here on Earth, you know? Right. So why, would, why would, why are we, a, I, I don't know. I, I like, I appreciate that somebody wants to, again, study this stuff, but. What oh, they, they, they get all excited when they, when they, uh, see a different pulse from a distant star. And look, it, it is really cool and really exciting, especially when you start doing the math and realize the light that your, your eye is getting from that star and how many millions of, of, of years that light has been traveling that is now ultimately received by your eyeball. Amazing, amazing stuff to think about. Wonderful thing to, 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 to take, take the, you know, astrophysics, physics in class and, and under, understand uh, of what's going on in the cosmos or as much as we can understand wonderful stuff to study. Not necessarily, I don't, I don't see how it furthers or helps the, you know, the United States of America. Other the amount of money that, the amount of money that our government is spending as we hit 30,000 or 30 trillion dollars in debt is just I don't understand why more people don't care. I don't get it. If we stack that in $1 bills, we'd be able to reach those distant planets before our radio wave does. There you go. Get to work. This is... Get to work? Mm-hmm. Start stacking. <laughs> this is a good time to remind you that these are our opinions and not those of anyone, not on the show, or any respective company for which we may work, own, or otherwise associate ourselves with on a regular or irregular basis. Also, you can find other episodes and relevant stories over at thegeorgiavirtue.com. 
Federal authorities are warning residents in coastal Georgia about Glock switches on uh, an illegal device which can convert handguns into automatic weapons. This is nuts. I mean, we're going to talk about the actual product, but I the media is like this is here. It's it's in our communities. Like it's like a public safety warning. It's not new, is it? No. No, it's not new at all. The method for getting them is new. Okay, let's talk about the the, the product. This is a specific to Glock. Now, any semi-automatic handgun, not a revolver, semi-automatic handgun, uh, with the right machinist, it, it wants to be automatic. In any semi-automatic rifle, we actually stop it from being automatic because the physics of blowback, uh, bringing the slide forward, and then and then a hammer going down again, we have to you have to actually stop to make it semi-automatic. All mm-hmm. right, so a, a Glock switch. If if you picture a Glock, the Glocks have a back plate on it. Very easy to take off. You can actually get custom, like, you know, vanity back plates. I don't know why, but you can. Uh, and, and and behind that plate is the striker, which, you know, in, in other guns would be a firing pin. So you have you have springs, you have a striker, and, and your ejector comes out, comes out through there. So this device, usually cube-shaped with a switch on it to go from semi to, to, to auto, and what it does is it it just kind of pushes back on, you know, as long as you hold the trigger down, it will continue to fire. And the ones that I've shot, totally legally, by the way, uh, I've, I've, I've run in circles with guys, people who are in the gun business and produce things for these things for export. Because uh, it's legal to make them here and sell them to police departments, federal agencies. You can also export them to friendly countries. Extremely fast, extremely uh, difficult to control. Uh, they're they're a cool toy, but but that's that's what it is. And it, and it uh, Glock already makes a fully automatic nine millimeter pistol. It's a Glock eighteen that's sold to uh, government agencies in this country and sold around the world to to different militaries and and police forces around the world. We either we it already exists. This was sort of a lower end way of taking, say, your Glock 17, which is a full length slide nine millimeter, and the caliber doesn't matter uh, on these things. Pretty much all the back plates are the same. Uh, you put it in, you tune it, you tune it up, and yeah, you've got you have a, a machine pistol. Okay. I'm so gonna... they're fairly simple to manufacture. If I mean, if people knew how simple it is to to take a uh, to make what's called an auto sear, if you had if you had the plans, auto sear for for uh, for an AR fifteen is nothing but a piece of tin. And it's I mean it's illegal. I mean you can find yourself in prison for a decade, but it's very simple to do. Is this something that you could three D print? I don't know. Because, you know, I, we are three. I mean, that's something that. We, I mean, we've talked about that on the show at pretty decent length, you know, um, printing <sighs> guns. And, and of course, they don't. The problem with 3D printing a gun is it doesn't last. But the same thing would probably happen with this because it does ride on the slide. So it moves, it gets rocked. Would it, would it work once? Maybe. Mm-hmm. Well, but would it would it continue to work? Probably not. But where these things are coming from is they're coming from China, and companies are labeling them something else, paperweight, whatever, and they're getting it from Alibaba or whatever, and they're coming they're coming in through import. There's no manufacturers here that are that are going to sell to uh, the guys in the block. It's 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 not it's not worth losing your company, everything you own, and your freedom. It's just not worth it. If these guys are making them, they're selling them legally because the licenses are so expensive, and you know everything they have is inventoried. Where these things are coming is they're not coming they're not coming labeled as Glock switches. They're coming labeled as machine parts or something like that. I guess my thing is is like it's just another. Um, opportunity, I guess, for the 
ATF and the media to really panic. Freak people. out. They, yeah. I mean, coastal Georgia is very large. I mean, if you think about Georgia having 10 million people, let's just understate and say that coastal Georgia, the you know, in the greater metropolis of it has a million people. They said that the ATF has seen an increase in the number of switchers confiscated across um, the county. Okay, so they want to talk about just Chatham County. They they seized 25 last year. I mean, I appreciate that that's 25 people that weren't supposed to have it and whatever. But 25, I mean, it's not like there's some, like, underground railroad of switchers in a pipeline. Like, that's not what's happening. Well, and here's the thing. How many of those were actual, and now I understand they're breaking the law. Were they confiscated from, from uh, people who were out committing crimes other than the possession of, of the of the full auto Glock system? Uh, how many were in their backyards as yahoos going, look what I, well, look what I found on Alibaba.com or whatever the, whatever the website is. I'm not sending people to go, <laughs> do not do that. It's a horrible idea uh, for something that's totally impractical for self-defense. Uh, yeah. First of all, if we didn't have if we didn't have the the law that Reagan signed into uh, signed into law, it, it, you would be able to buy this with a two hundred dollar tax stamp on it. But how did how did we get there? It was the drug wars in Miami with Uzis and uh, different drug lords hitting each other in the eighties that brought this about oh these 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 fully automatic weapons they're 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 killing our streets and it, it was that is what pushed it mm-hmm. you can still buy a full auto it's expensive because you have to have one manufactured and registered before the law went into effect i think it's 1986 uh but they're available i think i think a, a full auto tommy gun it's like made back in the 40s 50s whatever last time i priced one is around 60 grand uh, last time I priced an M60, which is uh, shoots a, a 7.62, which is like like a, like a 308, uh, was somewhere around eighty to a hundred thousand. I mean, that's great, a lot of money. They're great investments, and all they did was was price poor people out of it. Your your hardened criminal, your hardened gangbanger, does not care if the, most likely the gun he's carrying is illegal, and, and if he gets popped with with the Glock switch on there. He's going to federal prison, which is probably a lot nicer than the state pen. Mm-hmm. So what what's the downside for him? I don't know. But just... I mean... Yeah, I, I've, I said... I said that there are people... Like, they're so dangerous because you're unable to control the firearm in an effective way. So essentially those projectiles, those bullets, are being fired haphazardly and indiscriminately everywhere. That's not entirely true because they make a stock that snaps into the the back of a Glock, and uh, Glocks have a new ones, newer ones have a accessory rail. Now, look, if you're already making it into a machine gun, it does making it into a short barrel rifle does not make it any more any less illegal, uh, and well, it's it's fairly controllable like that. And I appreciate that, but you're also talking. I mean, a lot of times when you're talking when you're talking about like gangster thugs having weapons in the first place. They aren't trained marksmen. So, I mean, that's why innocent people are struck. And heck, when they do know what they're doing, sometimes innocent people are struck with bullets. Like, you're not any, I don't know. I, I just can't stand, it's, it's like, a, because it's a gun, it's, it's an increased threat to society. That's what it is. And, you know, the ATF, they're the worst alphabet boys there are. Well... It should be a convenience store, first of all. BATFE, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. They'll just keep adding letters on until they control everything. Right. <clears throat> Look, it's when the government does it, it's called collateral damage. When a gangbanger does it, it's, a, it's murder. When I'm talking about hitting something that's not your target. Mm-hmm. Collateral damage has been a part of war since, since war existed. It's a horrible thing when it happens. I'm not excusing what they're doing. I just, I don't think that you, I, I think there's a disconnect besides saying we'd find in Chatham County, we found 25 of these Glock switches and the idea that 
uh, drive-bys are happening with these things and innocent people are getting killed with them. There's what happens, there's a what happens cognitive someone, disconnect there. Yeah, I mean, what happens if somebody went in a convenience store with a shotgun? Oh, yeah, and it happens quite... I mean, the shotgun saying, the is... The damage is, would be, yeah. Yeah, the, the shotgun is the most affordable firearm anybody can have. That's one of those things where... <clears throat> you know, ask you what sh- if I have one fire in my house, what should it be? A shoddy. Uh, and, it's- and just as always, it's already illegal. And what good has that done? Right. Absolutely. I mean, there are, there are lots of goofy laws. If going back to the National Firearms Act with short barrel shotguns and short barrel rifles, a short barrel does not make it any more lethal. But th- again, this was in re- this was in reaction to a crisis. It was re- it was a reaction to the the mobsters. If you think about watching Bonnie and Clyde and and all that stuff, that's where these laws come from. Is they're passed at a time of crisis, and it sounds like the federal government is attempting to create a crisis because they're going to tie this into those thirty round nine millimeter Glock mags that that fit that fit and stick below it, and and they're going to. They'll get on the news and they'll show a picture of the switch on it with this 30 round mag and go, it, it could have killed 80 people with a single pull of the trigger. So it's, they are, they're creating a crisis and you're, and what, what you have to look for is the magician's trick. The reason magicians use really attractive assistants so you don't watch what he's doing, and that's what's happening here. Is they're creating a we're creating a crisis, so they they can come in and be the hero. And we have empirical, historical evidence to show this is what our federal government does, and they've been doing it in the relation to firearms for for over a hundred years. Okay, well, talking about stupid things the federal government does, I would think that's a perfect segue to the next topic. <laughs> she accused. Her ex-husband of abuse. She's still stuck with his student loans. Okay, so this is a Mother Jones article, and they're left-leaning for sure. But every now and then, they have pieces that I like. So that's how I ended up on the website. And they're talking about this program that was um, made available thanks to Congress back in 1993. So, um, and actually, I think it was eliminated... They said in 2006, but basically what it did was allow married couples who had education loans um, from separately to consolidate them into one single shared liability. So, and obviously the attraction of that, I guess, was to get a lower payment. I mean, obviously, why else would you consolidate? And then um, the only catch was that you could never unconsolidate them so mother jones puts out this article saying that this woman her name's michelle um she and her husband got divorced they divided all their assets and debts you know what you normally expect um but the loans um i guess were split between two of them they're not. They're they're joint borrowers. This well, no, this is, they weren't joint borrowers. Well, they initially. are now because they consolidated. Yes. They consolidated yes. together. They are now. So uh-huh. look, if 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 Connie came into to the marriage with me with with, with debt, I came in and we say, you know what, let's refinance everything in into one one payment and get it paid off, and then we divorced. This that loan is still joint. That the the joint the. Of, and I, I don't know specifically about this product, but I, I've seen it lots with uh, husbands and wives splitting up and trying to split up the house, and there's still a mortgage payment on it. And like, well, one of us has to buy out the other, or somebody has to have a good enough credit to, to refinance it. And when I was in banking, I had people come in with a court order saying, you have to take me out this loan. I'm like, no, that court order doesn't apply to me. Mm-hmm. That's That court order is for, is for you to refinance it, not for us to, it doesn't force us to take, why would a bank... Any lender, unless they're going to benefit somehow, or unless somebody is really qualified to take over the whole debt, why would they give up half the people responsible for paying it? They wouldn't. No, they so, wouldn't. And I'm sorry that she found herself in an abusive relationship, but 
they're basically advocating for special treatment because of that. And, you know, I would say, first of all, there's only 776 borrows in America that did the spousal consolidation loans. That's one of the reasons they got rid of it. Um, Because, I mean, if you talk about the 45 million people in America who have student loans or have borrowed, I mean... Hey, look, 776. I'm, I'm sympathetic to the fact that she was in a, an abusive relationship, but there's plenty of women or men who are in abusive relationships of differing varieties and they leave and they don't cite a reason for leaving like that other than irreconcilable con- differences and they can't split the debt. No, exactly. And look, they're, they threw this in there for the sympathy factor. As again, the magician, they're showing this over to abusive relationship. She's a victim. She absolutely is a victim. Uh, you know, if, if her accusation says she accused, he didn't say her ex-husband was convicted. So that's, that's a, a big thing that that's in the, that's in the, the headline uh, on Mother Jones is she accused him of it. And we know from several stories that we've done over the years that when it comes down to that kind of, that kind of abuse, accusation sh- is not necessarily fact, but let's assume that it is for the moment. I'm not condemning the guy. I because I I don't know enough about their situation to say it one way or the other. They joint jointly signed a contract. That's just the way it is, and it's in even beyond this product. If you co-sign for your wife, if you co-sign for if a, if a man if, or vice versa, wife or husband or wife or wife or whatever, for the student loans, and then you break up, guess what? It's still on your credit. Totally. I mean, that's part of what this is. I mean, they said that in the legal filing back in 2017, her husband, her ex-husband now, stopped paying on the debt. And so she's been, quote, forced to pay $60,000 to make up the difference and and to to do what he would not, or what he was supposed to be bound to do and has not done. Again, I'm sympathetic to that, but that's what happens when your co-signer's on I mean, if he would have died, it would be the same thing. No, absolutely. Is if you're the beneficiary on something and one person dies, uh, basically the asset goes back to the bank. Whatever whatever's left over after it's sold comes back to the benef- beneficiary. If if there's if there's an asset that's being held as collateral. With this, there's no collateral, and if we got the government out of student loans, people could actually bankruptcy out of them. You can't bankruptcy out of this, and I know that's the. The other frustrating thing with is you. Can, I, I'm sure they're frustrated that they can't even bankruptcy out of this. They okay, now but have. It's not a both, secret. Oh, I know. Oh no! I when they signed this, they knew, but they I got mean, they got they got enamored by the lower payment or the lower interest rate or whatever it was. And, and, you know, instead of making two payments, we're going to refinance uh, right right now for another thirty years. And Look, they they made a commitment that their their financial relationship on this particular financial product was going to last how how however many years. I'm just saying thirty years because that's a standard for a standard number. But they outside of that, outside of that contract, they signed another contract or outside of the marriage contract, they signed another contract that said this is going to last for thirty years and you are jointly responsible. Yeah, and I have no doubt that. Um the companies in situations like this. I mean, if it's anything like my student loans, which are backed by the federal government, so I have no doubt that it's at least somewhat similar. Like, anyone who has the username and password could log in. It's not like you're... And they can make a payment. But no, but it's not like um, you have to, like, jointly on every day of the month go and sit down together at the bank and make this thing happen like they act like she's being re-victimized because she's on, on the same thing as him um i mean if they wouldn't have been able to if they were going to sell the house and it was in 08 and they couldn't sell the house they would both still have to pay i mean like this this is not a unique situation i it really i don't i think it's really gross what they're doing with it it is <clears throat> you're right it's, it's, it's it is not is not unique uh it happens all the time and look she can go and get a federal judgment against him. If turning right. on what 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 their of course I'm not an attorney, uh, I, I'm an AC doctor. Uh, but I, I've seen if if he's in violation of his divorce decree that that they were jointly ordered to pay this and he was ordered to pay fifty percent of it every month or forty percent, he's in violation and can have a judgment put against him. 
So he's he's in violation of contract. And, you know, that's a, obviously the problem with in business partners. Uh, because, you, you know, you get one, you, you know, you can have one that turns into a turd. And this guy turned into a turd. Or whatever he decided he's not going to pay it anymore but she's she's not she's not a victim on that side of it you know she has she needs to go and pull the divorce papers out and anybody's been to divorce you know where they are because you have to if you ever want to get married again you better know where the hell they are so yeah, yeah. study assesses uh taking of black homeowners property in the 1960s this is something out of athens georgia um, I guess they just, dis- they discovered through some report or audit analysis by UGA professors that, um, a resident of black, of a black neighborhood in North Georgia lost more than $5 million on their properties when their homes were destroyed and replaced with university dorms and parking lots more than 50 years ago. Um, I guess it's the Linen Town section of Athens, which was... This was back in the 1960s, and it was part of an urban renewal plan. And they sold the land to the, they used eminent domain um, and sold the land to the Board of Regents. And then, obviously, UGA put parking lots and everything else. And um, UGA experts looked at what the lost properties would be worth today and what residents received them. And they also assessed the amount of appreciation lost by the displacement, displacement of other properties. They were not able to capture the impact on employment or education or the emotional trauma of being forced to move. Um, (sighs) I mean, you've got to be kidding me. Like. You, you, you cannot, you cannot retroactively 70 years later. uh, Well, 60 years later, go back in and say, well, had we not, had you not uh, sold this land uh, uh, at gunpoint, at gunpoint, uh, it would have been worth five million. Which I have no doubt. If you, if you look at the average price of a house in 1960 in Athens, I mean, what? Yeah, what and you're it? talking 10, about in an under grand? in an underprivileged portion in a community. I mean, you know, like we're not talking about um, Sea Island. Yeah, so I I have a problem with the way the study's written. I I. Also, don't have a problem with being highlighted that uh, eminent domain is theft. Uh, no, of but, course it is. But I mean, first of all, half these people are probably dead. Yeah. So again, you want to, I make it right with the people who haven't been wronged. I am. That's but, a but, problem but, to me. Second, but how do you how do you make it? How do you go back and prove they want money? Well, I know, but how do you how do you go back and prove? Because you know there was a good portion of the people in, in any intimate domain. The government comes in and says, "Hey, we're going to pay you 120 percent of market. We need this land. Uh, we're going to we're going to pay you 120 percent of market. There's no way you can sell it for that now. Uh, take you know take take that or there you know there's a good portion of them that were like hell yeah and, and took that check and, and cashed it." And, you know, you have that 20 and maybe less percent of people that were, would be holdouts. Like, you know, the the house from the movie Up was a real story. Is a, a, I can't remember, it was an old guy, an old woman who just refused to move. And then the mall was built around it. Yeah. Because they, they refused, refused to sell out. And lost tons of money, but that was, that was, that was home. And that happens to, to a up. lot of people, though. I mean, I, I totally disagree with the premise of eminent domain. And for a university, I mean, that's the whole economic development garbage that is it plagues communities. I, I, I'm, I'm with you. But um, first of all, I have a real problem when you want someone to when you want the government to pay restitution to you. I mean, they were compensated back then. Let's not let's I'm not saying that it was well, right. Exact- they were compensated yeah, exactly. at the time. Yeah, exactly right. For whatever the fair market value was judged back then. Now, if you could go back and they said that they underbid it, <clears throat> that, that that's an interesting conversation to have and how, how things should be done in the future. But after 60 years, you know, if you, what was the average age of a homeowner in 1960? 40? So that person be 100? Yeah, I... 
and and then I have a problem with once you know when you have been compensated, but you feel like it was inadequate that you want the reparations to come, and you're not even advocating for reform. Like if I felt like I was wrong by the government and I was um, in, I was due money. You could bet your butt I would also be hollering about changes to eminent domain. Yeah, look, eminent domain exists for infrastructure. Reservoirs. Imperative. Imperative. It's Interstates to- used a lot of it. Yes, yeah, not. Bases. Yeah, not going and taking, knocking down a, uh, in, in the case of, of, I think, what's going on in Dallas. But uh, I know there's a, a no-tell motel, as we call them, in a, in a liquor store that are <clears throat> being bought out to make the new amphitheater and stuff, which is going to totally beautify the area because that no-tell motel is, I mean, it's a, it's an establishment of ill repute. I mean, I, there's just no way it's not. I sat there and watched girls come and go one, one day sitting at, at a little country, country uh, restaurant. But <clears throat> the government being able to label stuff as blight, take it, knock it down, or say, oh, we've got to have this parking lot, or it was sure would be better on our tax revenue if we put up a mixed-use facility over here or built the Trump Casino in, in uh, uh, Atlantic City or probably thousands of other stories from around the country where uh, these, these small municipalities come and snatch stuff up. But Jessica, as we're winding down on time, you want to get your closing thought? So as the show drops, early voting is beginning. Just want to remind everybody not to early vote. Um, we have election day for a reason. Early voting, you can still learn about the candidates. You stuff you might find out more information, and you don't want to have already cast your ballot and have done it wrong. So give yourself the maximum amount of time to vote. Vote on election day because election day is American, and early voting is not. Well said. Uh, when I was flying back Saturday, the guy in front of me had Fox News on his uh, on his screen. Uh, as long as you're flying over you know, con- continental U- U.S., you, you have local TV. And saw that Naomi Judd had died. So I immediately you know, pull, uh, signed into the Wi-Fi and pulled up the story. And the wording on it is is very uh, it's very interesting that she was um, she died from mental illness, and that that was the official statement from from the sisters. And that's just uh, uh, it's very sad. She, she was 76. Uh, as the show drops yesterday, she was to be inducted into the uh, uh, Country Music Hall of Fame, about to start a tour, another tour with her daughter, kind of a farewell tour, because I don't know how, ma- how many chops you have at 76 years old to keep singing. But uh, it's very sad. It's always one of those things where, you know, you hope people can, could, can, can ask for help. And it's, uh, it's, mental illness is very real. And you know, and if you if you have a friend that you know that's prone to to uh, uh, to depression, it's if you haven't heard from him or her in a while, check in. It's not, I mean, just a uh, how how you doing? Maybe the time that they're you know they're trying to decide on what to do with their future, whether to have one. So on that cheery note, but an important one. Uh, yeah, it, it is important to yeah, ch- check on your family, check on your friends, and hell, just every once in a while, just let them know. Man, you need something. Let me know. I'm so, here. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'd rather rather talk to you at two o'clock in the morning than than hear about you at seven the next uh, the next day. Amen. So, for Jessica Salaji, my partner in endeavor, for Eric Cumby, who is getting this show very late <laughs> to, to get turned out. Not I'm Matt Lowlight. Not Matt Lowlight. It's not midnight yet. <laughs> I'm Dave Roberts. Have a great week. Catch me howling at the moon